Let's talk about religion. We have been talking about religion for a couple of weeks now. And uh, I have been trying to make a case that Christianity is like no other. There's nothing like Christianity. And I'm, and I'm not elevating Christianity over other world religions, but I'm elevating Jesus Christ himself, the person, not the religion. But yeah, for hundreds of years now, Christianity has been the most influential religion. And Jesus Christ has been the most influential person throughout the history of mankind. What's not to like about him? Right? He lived a, a selfless life. He helped thousands upon thousands of people. And he gave hope like no other. And the hope that he gives is a hope that will carry you and me through to eternity. But in the early century, first century, when Jesus was ministering here on earth, we can learn a thing or two about why people come to him and why people reject him. So with no further ado, please be on your feet. We'll be reading from Mark chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem and Edomia, and from beyond the Jordan, and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Heavenly Father, thank you for such a beautiful morning. The landscape is just a piece of evidence that you are an intelligent creator and you work wonders. And it's not just a beautiful sight to see. It is beneficial for all things because you are our creator. You provide for our every need. And for that, we're thankful. As we learn more about Christ, may we strive to be more like him in our speech and acts and choices. Help us become more effective in our God-given mission to be your ambassadors to the world. First to our family, then to our neighbors, then to the rest of the community and the world. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your seats. This message is called Disciples, Desperation, and Demons. Okay, let's talk about what we discussed last week. There were two items we uh, talked about. First, false religion makes one devout but deadly. And second, true religion makes one merciful and compassionate. Okay. Let's talk about what's going on around the passage, the background of it. The book of Mark follows with an account of the Lord Jesus and his disciples moving away from the religious leaders and Herodians and then returning to the sea. Since this was not the right time for Jesus to have his final word with the Pharisees, he avoids their hostility. However, this move did not stop the people from coming to Jesus. Instead, the crowds kept getting bigger and bigger. And those who came to Jesus did not only come from the areas within the vicinity of Jerusalem, but even well beyond the borders of Israel, from all directions. From the south, we have people from Jerusalem and Idumea. And from the east, people from Perea and the Decapolis, the ten towns. 
And lastly, from the northwest, people from Tyre and Sidon. Now, the writer informs us that the news about Jesus reached as far as the lands across the Jordan, southern Palestine, and even Arabia. So his ministry has gotten so massive that people from different communities and regions even were now coming to him to, to watch him perform his miracles. With that in mind, his ministry is now posing a serious threat to the Pharisees' leverage with the people. And his popularity has now grown to a point where the leaders in Jerusalem are shaking. They are, conf- they are afraid. So they sent representatives to Capernaum to investigate. And Mark uses the term crowd in the passage twice but implies that this is only because the people are interested in what Jesus is doing. Which is, I think, unsurprising, because at this point, people didn't have as much revelation as we do now. At this moment, only spiritual beings, including demons, are well aware of who Jesus really is. Nevertheless, the crowds flocking, gathering together to see Jesus, is critical to the upcoming ministry of the apostles. Now, the crowd is so massive. So Jesus tells the disciples to move away and charter a boat so that they could move to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Why? Because people, all kinds of sick people, were trying to to come to Jesus as close as possible, and for fear of crushing him, he had to move away from them. But not before healing many. He healed a lot of people that day. And I want to take note that there's There's a huge difference difference between the crowd and the religious leaders of Israel. So look at that. The sick are no longer waiting for Jesus to touch them. But instead, they come to him to touch him. On the other hand, the religious leaders of Israel are planning to kill him. The account also includes the evil spirit's response to Jesus' work and presence. They're falling down before him and declaring, this is the Son of God. No, they're not preaching. I don't think they're making a theological statement for, for those who are curious. The term son of God was used to refer to kings, particularly the kings of Egypt and emperors, particularly the emperors of the Roman Empire. Therefore, when the demon said, this is the son of God, was not necessarily a reference to Jesus' person as God, as the son of God. Moreover, in that era, most people would have considered it evil for demons to praise a name. People would not assume that demons were honoring Christ. Instead, people would think that these demons were trying to manipulate Jesus. But Jesus rebuked these evil spirits proving that he was in total control over them. And from a biblical standpoint, the term son of God or sons of God 
is used in different ways, at least five different ways in the Bible. It can refer to angels. That's found in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. Israel, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. The reigning king of Israel, 2 Samuel 7, 14. Adam, Luke's, Luke 3, 38. And true believers, Christians, as it is used in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 26. Now, in most cases, the term describes someone who has an intimate relationship with God. So I'm thinking the demon saying, this is the Son of God, simply means that Jesus has this intimate relationship with God, the Father, that there was no other way to describe it. However, they cannot stand in the presence of Him, so they fall down. And the Lord strictly tells them, stop making those statements. And another, another curious thing that I would like to make or, or put emphasis in is the word or the term strictly ordered. Strictly ordered. The original term literally means to admonish or charge sharply. Now the same word is used when Jesus rebukes the storm, sickness, and when he rebukes demons. So what we can see is that Jesus is sovereign over demons, over nature, and people, and sickness. Therefore, he is, after all, the Son of God. What can we learn from today's passage? I have three things for us to think about. Number one, disciples are not the same as spectators. So when you look at the first two verses here, you can see that the writer is trying to create a contrast between two subjects. One, the crowds, and two, the disciples. The crowds were there for two possible reasons. And I'm thinking, one, they were curious. They were just hearing all the buzz about Jesus and they wanted to know if it was true. And second, I'm thinking, they wanted to see miracles. Who wouldn't want to see a miracle? I want to see a miracle. I want to see a dead person be brought back to life. I want to see a blind man be able to see. I want to see the Colts win the district. And they did. But it's not a miracle. That's hard work and teamwork and good coaching and supportive parents. Hurrah! As verse 8 shows, great crowds came to Jesus because they heard all that He was doing, not saying. So the emphasis is in His works, not His words. Now, it could make a case that the number of people following Jesus around this time in his ministry was probably in the tens of thousands. And I'm thinking about those 5,000 men he fed. And in, in another instance, 4,000 men, not including women and children. So it's easily 10,000. And in John chapter 6, verse, 20, verse 26, Jesus rebukes the people. Hey, Jesus rebukes the people who wanted to see him, not because of the miracles, but because of a free meal. Now, a big chunk of that crowd was simply looking for a free meal, a free show, or to be set free from illness. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they wanted to know Christ, the person. Big difference. 
In fact, this is not the only gospel account that says the same thing. Let's read John 2, 23 to 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. If Jesus was not God, how could he know your thoughts and my thoughts? Let's shift the focus on the disciples. Did you notice that Jesus asked the disciples to get a boat so that they could get rid of the crowd? Did did you notice that? That's the Lord giving his disciples something to do. An assignment. In other words, that's a ministry. Get a boat. Now, he didn't give that privilege to the crowds. He gave it to his learners, his pupils. And one clear sign that you are a disciple of Christ is that God gives you something to do. Please ask your neighbor, do you have something to do? You see? So first, there's that desire. First and foremost, they were there, the disciples. They were there because they wanted to be with Jesus. They left their their jobs. They left their family because they wanted to follow Jesus. And now Jesus, seeing their loyalty, gives them something to do. In this case, to get a boat. So, how do you know if you're a disciple or not? There's that desire. But then, there's also that designation. God gives you something to do in His house. The sad truth about the church today, and this is just my observation, and it's, it's not strictly uh, an observation of our church. It applies everywhere. Okay? Okay? So one thing I've noticed about the church is that, and this could hurt, brace yourself. A lot of people in churches today are just a part of the crowd. They're not disciples. It's reality. Statistically speaking, only 20% of a church's population actually take part in the ministry. And I'm talking about church-ordained, God-given ministry. Now, I appreciate preaching to a full church. Don't get me wrong. Please don't don't misquote me on this. I I want you to come here. I want you to invite your family over. I want you to invite your friends. And those kids who come to Awana, I want to see them here on a Sunday morning. But more than that, I want us to realize the weight of Jesus' words when he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. And Jesus is telling you today, are you my disciple? Then do something. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in my house. Participate. Get involved. Contribute. Tell your neighbor, contribute. (laughs) Point number two. Desperation should lead one to Christ. Desperation. This is a big word in this passage. Now, during the time of Jesus, as we can see throughout the Gospels, poverty, sickness, corruption, all those things are prevalent. They were normal. Now, that goes without saying that political and economic conditions were far from ideal. It was bad. Therefore, a vast majority of the people were desperate for healing. They couldn't afford a doctor. They were desperate 
for deliverance. They were desperate for hope. They had no savings account to withdraw money from. They didn't have a federal government to send them $250 checks for GST credit. Funny. They didn't have family members to ask for help because those people themselves were in need. It was a point of desperation. It was hard. That's why those people, when they heard about Jesus and everything he was doing, hope erupted in their hearts. For those of you who don't know, I come from a country called the Philippines. It has some of the be- most beautiful beaches in the world. We've been to one of them. It's just paradise. It just, it feels like when you're there, you don't want to go home. You want to be there forever. That is, if you like beaches. Not everyone likes beaches. Some people prefer snow. Okay, I respect your preference. I prefer beach. Our situation back home, it's not very different from how the Bible presents Israel, first century Israel. Poverty, calamities, corruption, and a lot of other factors are undoubtedly some of the reasons why the Philippines is one of the poorest, poorest and yet most religious countries in the world. We're the only Christian country in Southeast Asia. And we proclaim Christ. And we teach the Bible in our public schools. We teach children to to pray in public schools. Pastors like myself, I was allowed to preach in campuses, and I did that. I preached to thousands of students. It was a huge, huge privilege. Because of the political situation and economic condition of the country, People are desperate for hope. And our faith plays a critical part in our survival as a nation. Because we know our hope does not rest in our government, in our own strength and connection, but God. God alone. Because we understand that without faith, We are doomed. And I understand no one wants to be in a state of desperation. No one wants to be there. We love our comfort so much that we do everything in our power to keep it that way. We want life to be as convenient and comfortable as possible. We have things that people can only drink of. I mean dream of, not drink. They cannot drink your John Deere's, but they can only dream about it. Our farmers use their bare hands for farming. Some manual tools, but tractors, those are just for the big players. But if you are someone who is already dealing with unimaginable life circumstances, You should be able to hear God more clearly. Your knees should shake to the point that they bend and seek God. Again, point of desperation should lead you to Christ. There's nowhere else to go to. There's no one else to turn to. Jesus is your best bet, if I could use that word. And in times like these, who we listen to, who we turn to, is critical to our survival. You don't want to go to a pessimist, a person who talks nothing but negative stuff. And you don't want to go to someone who would tickle your ears, but not necessarily say the truth. You want to go to someone who can help, 
someone who is willing to help. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 29. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I know that even though finances are not really a big problem in this part of the world, I know that human hearts in this country, in this community, are desperate for hope. And I'm telling you today, right now, without a shadow of a doubt, that real hope is only found in Jesus Christ. Your bank account, there will come a day that it's not going to matter. Your properties, as many as they are, they will come to a point that they won't even matter. They can't even buy another day of life. And you're fighting for your last breath. Money won't matter. But faith will produce so much joy in your heart and you will welcome death as something that will give you the greatest joy because once and for all you will see your king. The guy you have been singing to every Sunday morning, you will meet him face to face and call you his child. Isn't that amazing? My friends, have you really, have we really come to that point of spiritual desperation that we know that there's no one else to turn to, there's nowhere to go but God? I don't want to say this, but unless you have gotten to that point, you should, you shouldn't be too confident in your faith. You have to reach a point of desperation to know that you need a Savior to begin with. Last point for today. Demons are powerless in the presence of Christ. So demons essentially are Satan's puppets. So they do what what their master is doing. They steal, they kill, and destroy. That's their reason for existence. Their job is to make your life, is to make my life miserable. They're eternal. They're powerful. As such, they can control people, especially those who live in sin. However, they're not all powerful. There are things they cannot do. When they are confronted by Jesus, they just fall down because they're weak like babies in His presence. But if there's something worth noticing about these demons in this passage, it's their knowledge of Jesus and their submission to His authority. Imagine, demons obeyed Jesus' words. And in the Bible, we can see that these demons sometimes unwittingly serve God's purpose. In Judges chapter 9, God used a demon to punish wicked king Abimelech. And in 1 Kings chapter 22, a demon was tasked to prepare the execution of King Ahab. So Satan may be their ultimate leader, their leader, I mean, but ultimately they submit to Christ. Christ remains sovereign. Now Jesus, when he died on that cross to people, to demons, it looked like a defeat. But don't be deceived. Things aren't always what they seem. Jesus' death on the cross was actually his path to victory. Here's what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them 
in him. So demons are powerless. They only become powerful when we give them a reason to. When we live in sin, we give them a foothold. And they're going to use that weakness. They're going to use that sin to manipulate us. But my friends, let's refuse to be manipulated. We have a mind of our own. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have Jesus interceding for us. We can say no to a life of sin. Do you want to live a victorious life? Say amen if you do. Do you want to live a life where you don't have to worry about about your life, yourself living a double life, you're, you're living a holy life on Sunday, but the rest of the week you are not so holy. The only way for you to do that is to honor Christ in your life. Surrender. That's the big word here. Surrender your life to Him. Surrender your sins to Him. Surrender your future to Him. And every day, each morning, is going to be a day of purpose and meaning and joy and peace. But I'm not saying that we'll always win. Obviously, we don't. But we know that God will never disown us. Even when we're not faithful, He remains faithful because He cannot deny who He is. God is true and faithful. So are you a disciple of Christ? Or are you a mere follower? Are you just a part of the crowd? Are you a part of the crowd that eats Jesus' free bread, free grape juice, but at the same time you're also the one who says, crucify him, crucify him. I was. I was lost, but now I'm found. I hope you have the same experience. Come to Jesus. He will take you in. He'll forgive you and give you a new life. For anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come.